Welcome to It's Bloody Complicated, the Compass podcast. I'm Neil Lawson, your host and director of Compass. These are unprecedented times and we need to rise to the new and enormous challenges we now face. Over the next few weeks, we'll be speaking with writers, thinkers, politicians, journalists and public service workers about how we come out of this mess in much better shape than we went in, a good society after COVID-19. These conversations have live access for Compass members who can put their own questions directly to our guests. If you'd like to participate in a live call and help support all of our work, go to compassonline.org.uk forward slash podcast to join Compass today. Otherwise, sit back, relax and enjoy this week's podcast. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining the podcast this evening. Um, I'm your host, uh, and it changed to the normal scheduling. Um, Neil isn't here this week, uh, and he's passed over to me. I'm Francis, and I am the Deputy Director at Compass. Uh, you'll probably be hearing a bit more of me soon uh, and in the future. While we're waiting for Steve, I thought we would give us the chance to uh, just introduce Mike, who is one of our two guests for this evening. Uh, Mike Wilson is the uh, Executive Director at Pembroke House, uh, which is a social centre and residential community in Walworth, which is in South London, just off the old Kent Road. It's also where I happen to live, because as well as being a community centre, Pembroke House has a residency attached to it. And Mike is going to say a little bit more about the history of settlements, which is what Pembroke House is. But a large part of it is that there's a residency attached to the, to the social centre. And five residents live here. We all have other jobs, so my job is at Compass, but we also volunteer a bit of our time in various roles um, to take in the community and to uh, contribute in some way or other, depending on our skills and experience. Um, so my job is as the events officer, which has meant that I had to put on hold all of our funds for the epic street party that we have every year, and I'm now considering doing an Italian style street socially distance opera slash bring your own instrument open mic session, which Mike doesn't know about. So we're, we'll, we'll, we'll try and uh, loop those plans effortlessly into tonight's conversation. But Mike, do you want to just introduce yourself and say a little bit about Pembroke House and um, the history and what it does now? Yeah. No. Thanks for inviting me on. So, um, we should probably say, Francis, that you are just the other side of this door as well, aren't you? So I'm, I'm currently sat in Pembroke House. Um, I have uh, maybe one of the fortunate positions in lockdown that means that I live very close to here and we've needed somebody actually to be opening the building because we flipped it into a uh, sort of a major food distribution hub. So I, I get to walk in and, and sit in this little office every day. So I'm sort of not lockdown, full lockdown experience in my house, but that means that people on Zoom often get a bit confused and, and ask me why I have a fire escape um, in, over my shoulder. And that is a fire escape that lives to, that moves to, uh, takes you to where Francis and the other residents here live. So, I mean, Pembroke House, um, what we are is a, uh, a multi-use community centre and a residential community. Um, we have been in this community, this part of um, South London, which is Woolworth, um, for uh, you know about almost 135 years now. Um, so we were founded um, in the late 19th century by uh, a bunch of students. Um, and these were students who were at the time um, appalled by what they saw as sort of growing inequality in inner cities um, and a sense that actually the existing responses we had to that inequality, those of sort of markets or the state or the traditional model of philanthropy at the time, just weren't really up to it. And we needed to do something quite different and quite radical to, to meet the challenge of that um, inequality. And their answer you know, was actually radically simple as well. They just said, well, let, let's take some of these major problems. Let's take some of the questions of, of policy and practice um, and let's um, actually zoom them down into the question of actually, what does it mean for us to live in an area that is marked by that inequality? So they came to um, found a residency, a house um, in Woolworth in South London. Um, and they committed to living here and working alongside local residents and partners as neighbours um, and to try and look for new solutions together with those residents, with those partners, with the other organisations working here um, to some of the problems and the long standing problems of inequality in, in communities like this. Um, I think, sort of, settlements. Um, 
you know, we were one of many. The first such settlement was Toynbee Hall that was founded over in the East End. We were founded the year after Toynbee Hall. Um, I think we often say, and, and Francis as a resident, you, you will know this more than most, we often say that actually the, red, the, the history of settlements um, is actually incredible, but very little known. Um, and they've had an amazing impact on the sort of the, 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 the shape of the society that we currently live in now. So things like the old age pension, the beginning of free legal advice, were ideas founded in, in places like this and tested in, in places like Pembroke House and other settlements. And you know, people like William Beveridge or Clement Attlee cut their teeth um, here in places, um, in settlements across London. Um, and actually they took some of the lessons that they learned from their time in these communities, working with local residents, working with partners, um, and then thought, well, how do we translate some of these lessons to questions of policy or practice further afield? Um, and they, you know, they've had this sort of quite hidden, maybe subterranean impact on, on the modern state and the modern welfare state in particular. It wasn't just a movement in London, it was across the whole of the UK and it wasn't just a movement of the UK, it was an international movement. So one of our big heroes here at Pembroke House is um, Jane Adams, who founded the first settlement um, in the United States in the west side of Chicago. And uh, similarly known, you know, like Beveridge, like Attlee, the, the, the settlement movement in the States is marked really by the extraordinary lives of the people who came to live here and whose lives were changed by the experiences that they had. And she's now sort of commonly known as the mother of social work and a, and a great activist for children's rights, for women's rights, for immigrant rights in, in the US. So that, that's the sort of history. I guess what we're doing today is um, asking ourselves, okay, well, that, that's a lovely story. Um, but what's the relevance of this sort of 19th century model of, of charity and of life together um, for some of the questions of today? And I think really we've been on a journey at Pembroke House asking that question over the last 10, sort of five, 10 years in particular. Um, we have somehow clung on. So we've always been open um, since we were first founded in 1885. And we are one of the few settlements that still exist. Many of them shut actually almost as a result of their own success because the, you know, some of the models of community work that they were developing and uh, helping to inspire ended up being taken by people like Beveridge and Attlee into the model of the new state. Um, and, you know, began to see the state picking up some of the responsibilities and some of the actions that previously had been done by settlements. And there was a question, a real sort of crisis of confidence in settlements and, and many of them shut asking what their, what their role was. Somehow, and it's mainly you know, by accident as much by design, Pembroke House has stayed um, uh, sort of alive through all of those different periods um, uh, over the last 135 years. And in the last five to 10 years, we've been asking a very deliberate question, which is actually what, what does a settlement model tell us for some of the challenges of today? And I think the key sort of turn for us there is, well, if you look at Woolworth today, this, you know, we're just south of Elephant Castle, you could say that some of the conditions are very, very similar to the conditions that face some of these first students who came to found this place with a growing inequality in inner cities rather than a narrowing inequality, a growing one. And the sense that, you know, traditional responses of the state or traditional responses of charity or of community work um, or, or, or the wider response of sort of community, the reform movements that we've seen over the last decades here I mean, you know, they don't look like on their own, they're going to lead to some of the solutions that we need to really tackle the root causes of that inequality. Um, so we are asking ourselves in that, in that context, well, it feels like the time is right for something like a new radical response, a new settlement model for the 21st century. Um, and that's, I guess, the, the sort of journey that we've been on. And we're convinced that that has a few key components to it. We, we think that that model is going to be rooted around residency. So this, this, fun, this sort of central idea of something rooted in a particular community. Um, we think the model is going to be around social in, interaction and engagement. And that's always been a key component of the settlement model is bringing people together out of very different backgrounds to, to tackle common, to com, common um, problems and, and common challenges. And we think it's, it's hooked on an approach to working in a neighborhood. So, in a wide, being 
resident in a neighborhood means you can work here as neighbors and as partners, not just as traditional in inverted commas, charity workers or professionals. So we're beginning to explore some of that and to ask ourselves again, is there a, what can we do in these local communities where we, whereby we can learn lessons from that very, very local work ingrained in local communities that can once again maybe inform wider policy and practice. So we've set ourselves a challenge of, you know, what the hell does a settlement model or a movement for the 21st century look like? This crisis um, around COVID-19 has demanded that all of us work quickly and cooperatively towards these shared goals. And we've seen a big surge in community responses with sort of millions of people signing up and mobilizing to support their neighbors. And local government and community organizations have been at the heart of that approach. So. The reason for bringing Steve and Mike into this conversation is because at Compass we talk a lot about 45 degree politics, which is the alliance between the local vertical state and neighborhoods and community organizations, which tend to do things in a much more horizontal approach. So uh, at this juncture, I'd like to um, uh, introduce Steve. Uh, the, Steve is the Shadow Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government. And as many of you will know, has a long background and experience in um, working at, from a bottom-up approach as well in local councils. He was the sort of founder of cooperative councils when he was at Lambeth. And so we're gonna dig into some of that in a bit more detail and work out how communities and councils have been working together in this crisis. Uh, so the format will be that I will put some questions to both of these guys, and then we will open up to all of you in about sort of 20, 25 minutes time. If you'd like to point, uh, for any sort of comments or questions already at this stage, you can find the chat box at the bottom of your screen in the bar on the bottom. And as Jack helpfully reminded us, if you want to tweet about the conversation, the hashtag is it's bloody complicated. And finally, just note that this conversation is being recorded to go out as a future podcast. Um, so please do keep your questions brief, try to be clear, um, try to use as few words as possible, and that's a challenge for me too. So without further ado, thanks so much for joining us, Steve. Um, I just wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself. Um, thanks for, for pushing through the challenges of Zoom and technical difficulties. So do you want to just give a little bit of information about who you are, what your current role is, and perhaps what you're interested in tonight's conversation around this whole theme? Yeah, hello, hi Francis, and, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't see you because of a technological issues have prevented me, uh, but it's lovely to hear you regardless. Um, yes, I'm Steve Reid. I'm the um, uh, Member of Parliament for Croydon North. But I'm, I'm, I'm now Shadow Secretary of State to Communities and Local Government. And I, I mean, it's, I've long felt that our democratic model does not respond uh, well enough to the communities that we are trying to serve. Fundamentally, people do not have uh, a voice and they do not have the power to assert that voice over the decisions that affect them. And this is becoming more and more of a problem as the world changes all around us. People have got access to information, data, networks, choice over their life, their lifestyles that, that previous generations didn't have. And we can't just stick with an analog model of politics in a digital world. It just feels out of sync. And I think this really came to a crisis uh, first of all, would be the financial crash in 2007, when it became clear to people that the you know the implicit contract between citizens citizens and the state had broken because the state failed to protect them. Then the 10 uh, well 13 now years of austerity that have that have followed, the decline in wages that people experienced after that, huge huge impacts of globalisation on communities, climate change on communities and people unable to influence these giant currents that are swirling around and changing their lives. And all of that, the fear that people now fear in the, fear in, in the future, has pushed people towards models of uh, populist nationalism that demands from those of us on the progressive wing of politics a response which cannot be, we have to just stick with the same. We have to find a more radical, a more attractive um, alternative that gives people back hope in a future. And for me, that is deepening democracy, doubling down on democracy, using new technology, open data networks to try and give people the ability to assert voice over the decisions that affect them, whether that's in the workplace, in their communities, over the public services that, that they use. And it, it demands of us a reset of our politics. So 
that this, I think, is the, the, the political challenge of our age. And, and, and it's by opening up our politics and really addressing the inequalities of power that underpin the more visible inequalities of wealth, uh, opportunity, health and education that, that are perhaps more visible. It's by addressing that that we can protect democracy and renew democracy for the future. Thanks. And if it would be, uh, it would be great if you could say a little bit about your experience as well um, at Lambeth and what led you from these sorts of insights to set up cooperative councils. If you could tell people a bit about what cooperative means in this context and a little bit also about the difference that it made to the way that councils operated. Yeah, well, I mean, everything I just said, I learned while I was uh, leader of the council in Lambeth after, between uh, 2006 and 2012. I, I mean, La Lambeth gave me the best education I've ever had. Um, better than I got at university, I would say. And um, what, what I discovered is that, I mean, Lambeth, when I was elected leader, we took over from a conservative Lib Dem coalition, was one of the uh, worst performing councils in the country. We had services in free fall. Our children's services were rated in the bottom 3% in the country by Ofsted. That's, that's services for kids who are adopted, fostered, or on the uh, safeguarding register. Could not afford to have those services failing. And the, the thing that improved them was giving a bigger voice to the people who were on the front end of those services. So the frontline workers who could see the problems uh, with what was happening, but also the people that were using the services, uh, the foster carers, the children in care, and we, we, we basically used models of co-production that allowed those people to have a real voice over, first of all, the outcome they wanted to achieve in their life or through that service, the intervention they thought would benefit them rather than the intervention that the council tried to fit them into. Um, and also they wanted to say over how and who, how that service was provided and who provided it. Uh, and by making the service more responsive to the front line, they dramatically improved. So by the time I left Lambeth in uh, 2012, the council's uh, children's services had moved from being rated in the bottom 3% nationally to being rated the best in the country and outstanding in every, um, in every category. And, and for me, a major part of that was giving voice to, to people whose insights into their own life are always going to be better than the insights that other people have got. The, the reason we use the word cooperative, cooperation, it wasn't because you need to run everything through cooperatives, although of course that is one option. The, the, the principle was we were trying to foster cooperation between the decision maker and the person affected by, uh, by that decision and try to equalize the power dynamic between them uh, so that you, you went from a, a system that was fundamentally paternalistic to one where the service user could participate in a decision that led to better decisions, but it also led to some very vulnerable people starting to feel that they had control over the things that affected their lives. And in many cases, this was something new for them and it started to build their self-confidence and uh, their ability to, uh, to feel um, self-reliant, uh, to have greater levels of self-esteem. So, in, uh, and once we started doing it in observing it happening in one service, we asked ourselves the question, well, if you could do it in, children's services can you do it in housing services can you do it in environmental services and you could and from that we got a whole new approach to running public services in that council at that time we called it the cooperative council but really it was about using models of co-production or co-creation to empower the front line so that they could assert voice over the decisions that affected them uh, and it, it produced better outcomes for the people using those services and it also it also helped to rebuild trust in broken politics because politics became something that people could wield themselves rather than something that you abdicated to politicians uh, i mean it, it was a it was a, an extraordinary experiment but it, it did seem to work yeah and i'm interested in this idea of an experiment because it's very much part of also the settlement approach as well so i was going to ask mike a sort of similar question around that and maybe also leading us on to the present moment so Settlements have a history of working, as sort of Steve was saying in that way as well, between encouraging participation in the community and also linking to local state. You mentioned Jane Addams and a number of other kind of activists who help make that bridge between institutions and local communities. And I was wondering, does Pembroke House see itself as continuing that tradition uh, and maybe a little bit about what that has now meant in the challenges of the current moment being that sort of channel between local state and community. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think the key thing um, for us is we, you know, we see that there are conversations that happen at a sort of a national policy level or even a local authority level that seems so unbelievably disconnected from the reality of communities and individual lives. Um, you know, I, I, in my previous career, have worked in central government. Um, I've worked at very much at the front line, and there's always been a frustration about those two our twin conversations going in completely different directions. So, you know, fully agree with Steve's um, aspiration and that aspiration to bring those and equalize some of the power dynamics involved in, in these different types of conversation. But I think there's a real challenge about the, the practice of how we do that. And I think um, what we have been experimenting with, and one of the things I think we've been learning over the last few years here at Pembroke House is that there, there, are, there are types of co-production that actually are not an equalized power relationship that are actually just maybe a mirroring of traditional models of consultation, but in a different name. There's types of co-production that actually edge a bit, a bit more closely to co-option rather than kind of genuine dialogue and debate. Um, and I think the, the challenge therefore is how do we create these spaces and these places where people can come together and actually genuinely learn to speak as equals and, and begin to maybe put off some of the baggage of their profession or, um, or the, the baggage of their backgrounds and begin to actually engage with each other as humans, as people who actually have equal voice and equal say um, and recognizing the role that we all have to make in, in sort of creating a, in a better type of conversation, a better neighborhood. So that, that's a major bit of, I think, the, our, our approach here at Pembroke House is to look at ways that we can practically do that. And, and we do that via thinking about very deliberately about contexts, trying to find ways in which if any ever anyone comes to us as a funder or a commissioner or a politician, we always get them sitting around a table eating lunch um, with, with participants, with local community members, with our team. It's around those type of environments when you stop being Mike, executive director of Pembroke House and Steve, um, you know, shadow, shadow minister for communities and we start becoming Mike and Steve and you're meeting Francis, our local resident, you know, that's the type of environment that we need to work out how we can build those and take some of those lessons um, into wider policy and practice. I think, you know, in terms of what we've seen locally um, in through this crisis is actually over the last eight, nine weeks, what we have seen is moving beyond, we've been talking about co-production we've been talking about work together across boundaries of state and civil society and health and council what we've seen is we've seen people mobilize around a crisis um, and an ur urgency of crisis and we've moved further in the last eight to nine weeks than we have in the six years that I've been here previously in terms of some of that collaboration and in terms of some of that work together I think there are lessons to be learned from that that I'm sure we'll unpick through the conversation but I think where we've seen that work unbelievably well in areas of Southwark and areas of South London where we work is where actually that's launching off some of those existing relationships where we've practiced that um, socializing together as groups, as teams across organizations that means that we can mobilize those relationships and flip them really quickly. So um, I think there is lessons where you've not seen that work has often be where a lot of that hard graft has not been done previously. Um, and we can unpick a lot more in terms of the lessons of the crisis. But. Yeah, so I wanted to bring in Steve on that particular point as well, because, you know, as you'll know from your experience at Lambeth, this isn't always plain sailing. And especially also in the, in the crisis, uh, we've seen a lot of also people scrambling to respond. And a lot of people, through a lot of goodwill and ev evidence and shows that people are really keen to volunteer, but that can also create differing expectations of ways of working, who holds power, who holds data, who's responsible. And I just wondered, Steve, whether you had any reflections on, on the past few weeks, like Mike has, of how that has fallen out uh, in specific cases, maybe, or in the overall picture, which point towards a kind of new understanding of 45 degree politics, which maybe gets to the heart of also some of those frictions and tensions that you might have found when you're working at Lambeth? Well, I mean, yes, we, I mean, we have seen an extraordinary change in local government in the last few weeks. We've seen service integration at pace, um, the digitization of services at pace, and the development of a community, community front end through the mutual aid groups happening at pace. Um, and it, it's worked differently in different areas, but where it's worked well, it's been quite extraordinary. Uh, to see what's happened. I, 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 for my, I think it's really important 
we try to keep hold of as much of that as possible and move it forwards after the crisis rather than go back to where we were before. Now, this will require, it's not just councils, it's public services in general, to behave differently in, in future. We, we tend to organise our public services as if they're financial institutions. So the main motivating uh, element, factor in their design is control, just like for, uh, uh, hierarchical financial control organisations. But actually, communities are dynamic. Communities are fluid. We need to be innovating all the time to keep pace with the changes that communities uh, are experiencing uh, and to have a truly responsive um, uh, ability to, to react uh, to, to, to new issues and, um, and problems in communities or opportunities as they arise. So we perhaps need something which is less hierarchical, uh, less vertical and, and flatter, structures that are more akin to what you might see in, in the creative sector. It, it, it seems to me that you know communities being dynamic and fluid. We need to have a creative state rather than a controlling state uh, working with them. So we need to be finding new ways to be more fluid, engaging, and there are forms of co-production that allow that, but they require uh, changes such as um, fully open data and information. A lot of public services, the government, uh, particularly national government at the moment, are very, very closed about their data. But if, if, if service users, citizens cannot access data, it's very hard to take, to participate in the decisions that are based on, on that information. So I think we need, we need an open data charter, which is pretty much um, public services, councils will publish all data that they're not legally prevented from publishing. Uh, and that, that, then that, that opens up the ability for greater levels of scrutiny um, and decision-making. And, and I think we need, we need models of, I mean, it's a horrible term, but, but commissioning, which is basically how you decide what services you're going to provide for people, who's going to provide them and how they will, provide, will be provided. We need models of commissioning that genuinely put the people who are on the receiving end of those services right at the center of taking those decisions. And where those people do not have the capacity to participate um, easily, which is going to be a large number of people who are heavily reliant on public services, um, then the role of the, the council becomes to wrap that capacity around them or their advocates so that they can take part in the decisions uh, that affect them. It's a much more fluid, open form of direct democracy, if you like, but it does mean people start to uh, take back control over the things that affect their own lives. And my experience in Lambeth was when we started doing that in certain services, so children's social, uh, children's services I just referred to, but, but, but also housing and other services. Once you started doing that, the community itself responded by throwing back all of these other ideas for things it could do differently to how the council was doing them. Let me give you one very quick example. Um, we had a housing estate at the top of Hampton Hill, and the community fundraised to put um, solar panels on, on the top of the block to generate sustainable energy that could be used in those blocks. Um, the energy they got was cheaper than they were getting from the national grid. So they, they, they were able to provide cheaper energy to low-income households. They were able to provide employment opportunities for local unemployed uh, people as well. And you were getting sustainable energy. So you got three benefits from the project. And it grew from that to become what is now, uh, I think it's called repowering now, which is the country's biggest um, sustainable energy generating cooperative. That came, that's just one of dozens and dozens of initiatives that came from the community, not the council, just because the council opened up participation much more widely. People took that stimulus and they really innovated. And, you know, I was blown away by the changes that we saw when we did that. The Brixton Pound was a, uh, another project that came out of that, a, a, a hyper-local currency that had an exchange rate with sterling, but, but it had the effect of keeping money circulating in the local community and promoting a, a sort of a sense of civic pride uh, in the locality as well. But I mean, those are just two of dozens of projects I could refer to. But, but that, I think, is the future model, more open, more participative and allowing the innovative, uh, the innovation that is in communities to come through uh, and reshape how, how services are delivered.
Thanks, Steve. And I'm sure we'll get into a few more of the examples because I know people are always keen to learn from where places have done this well. I've got one final question before we're going to open up to some of the questions from members as well. Um, and that one is to Mike. So very specifically in the last few weeks, you know, Pumpkin Book House has had to change its activities. So rather than maybe more this participative approach where we also seek to be quite community led in what we offer and want people to feel that it's something that's co-produced in, in, in that sense, in a very direct sense. So getting members of the neighborhood to take on projects and supporting them to do that. We've taken a very different role in being set up as a food distribution hub, providing emergency food parcels for people in need during the crisis. Um, and you know, I'm sure you'll say all of us have been massively in awe by how quickly it's been put together and the number of riders. We, this is all operating on sort of delivery style system. So uh, without all of the exploitation, one would hope. <laughs> so all of the uh, riders are coming out and they do little shifts and they run through the neighborhoods and basically drop food parcels for people in need. But my question about this was really that it's, it's raised an interesting point here about all through this conversation, we've talked about councils and community institutions, not just offering people things or giving people things or providing people things, but it's a two-way street. So I was wondering, Mike, what you, how you were reflecting on how this might have changed what you feel about what Pembroke House does, or maybe, maybe reaffirmed some belief in those values that things do have to be participative. Um, and that's the better way to operate apart from in times of crisis. Mm. I think, I mean, I think it's fascinating um, because, you know, what we saw at the beginning of this, it was really clear at the very, very beginning of lockdown that um, food insecurity was going to be really the face of this first phase of the crisis. Um, and, you know, it was also clear that um, for many and varied reasons, there was not anywhere near the resources or, this, or the capacity to meet the scale of that crisis by people working in their ordinary ways. Um, and that this needed a, a very urgent and stark response. And, and actually that that wasn't, there was a flourishing and there was this sort of burgeoning of things like the mutual aid group starting on different neighborhoods, starting at the street level. There was, um, but there was a real sense at the same time as this amazing sort of groundswell of new volunteers and people wanting to get involved in local communities. There was also a sense of just people bolting in different directions, right? So the, the councils were doing, you know, our local authority was doing one thing, our GP surgeries and local NHS were doing another thing, other voluntary sector organizations were doing another thing again and none of these responses were sort of coordinated and none of these responses often were sort of working collaboratively together and what we needed in that moment was really clear stark um, and uh, and very bold actual leadership you know we needed people to step forward and say look we need to do this now and this is urgent we need to start building out new supply chains to get food to people who are desperately in need urgently we can't wait around we have to do that now so we actually had to step forward and it was a time when actually almost a reversion to some more command and control responses rather than collaborative responses there were people really stepping forward and saying actually um we need to learn more at the moment from humanitarian aid responses than we do from traditional ways of working in um the third sector or or, or with the local authority partners and so in those first, those first couple of weeks of the crisis were really marked by that and a sense of realism and the need for clear leadership and clear direction. That enabled actually some of those horses, maybe that were bolting in different directions, to begin to start sort of herding towards actually looking in the similar directions and beginning to come together. Um, and we saw um, things to align in ways that they weren't aligning. Um, I think though the critical, you know, and we saw through that places like Pembroke House, we flipped into becoming a food distribution hub. We've been feeding 5,000, um, we've now done 5,000 food parcels to local residents, um, as you say, all through working in parallel with local volunteers and mutual aid groups. And that's an amazing partnership with the local council and our GP partners locally and the local um, clinical commissioning group. So it's been a collaborative effort, but it's required us to really step forward and say, look, this is what we need to do. Um, and actually, we are going and we're going to point the direction and we're going to say this is the way we need to go. I think now, as this sort of first phase of this crisis is coming to a close and we're looking now at this sort of second phase where we will be having to consolidate and adapt some of these emergency responses that have sprung up um, through this sort of first few months. I think actually our, our focus now needs to change. And I think this is a real challenge um, for some of the collaboration that we've been talking about for 
the rest of the call, the beginning of the call, is to say, well, look, we needed leadership to get people to work differently. Actually, we needed a really bold vision and we needed to actually bang some heads together to get people to push forward and work differently. We've taken up quite a lot of space, therefore, um, in that leadership position. How do we now twist and open that space out so that we can start actually building the longer term collaboration and the, and the seeds of a longer term legacy here that actually is marked by the, some of the characteristics that Steve has been talking about previously and we've been picking up in different bits of the call. I think that, that balance between bold leadership and then the sort of openness and the humility to throw open the doors and, and just maybe step back and facilitative leadership is one of the key questions about the 45 degree change, I think, and about how some of the practicalities about how we see genuine collaboration happening in communities that meet needs, that is transformative, but that also begins to think about from its very beginning how we build a legacy and a capacity in a system and in communities and neighbourhoods that can actually facilitate a much more organic change in the longer term. Fantastic, thank you. Hello, this is Grace from the Compass Office, interrupting for a moment. I'm lucky enough to come from a large and politically diverse family. We really did have the full political spectrum represented over Christmas dinner, but in spite of our differences, we still actually like each other. Um, I've always known, because of this, that politics should be more about listening and learning from the people we disagree with than shouting at them and fighting with them. And of course, I've definitely known for a long time that it really is bloody complicated. So I was so happy that when one day I discovered Compass quite by accident through their brilliant work on the Progressive Alliance in the 2017 general election. Since then, it's been an absolute pleasure to once again be part of a political family where talking to people in different political parties, admitting that you alone don't have all the answers is not just okay, but actively encouraged. So if you'd like to find out more about Compass, you can visit compassonline.org.uk. And now back to the conversation. So now at this point, we're going to open up to members. Uh, do, don't forget, you can put your comments in the chat box. On, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. So you can just drop us a line there and Grace is going to pick up for us. So uh, thanks, Grace. Uh, I think we can take the first question. OK, first up, I wanted to bring in Diana Toynbee. Um, if you can hear us, Diana, you should be able to speak as well. Can you, can you hear us? You may need to unmute her or she unmute herself. Give it a try. If not, we'll move on. No, okay, never mind. Um, so the question that Diana asked right at the beginning of the conversation was about the work of Hilary Cotterman. She was asking specifically to what extent that relates to the kinds of things that we're talking about here. So. Well, I just wanted to jump in there quickly because I'm very hopeful, Hilary, if you're listening, very hopeful that uh, Hilary uh, is going to come and join our Pembroke House uh, session that we're running for people because Hilary just lives down the road in Peckham. She's also uh, come on the Compass podcast before, so quick shout out for that. Uh, go back and listen to her episode. It was awesome. Um, but I also know that Steve and Mike will both know Hilary as work. And so, Steve, do you want to comment on how maybe some of Hilary's ideas might intersect with some of your work around the Cooperative Council? No, they, they completely intersect, not least because um, Hilary was involved in the Co-op Council in Lambeth while we were developing it. So she was running um, a project just across the border in Southwark called Southwark Circle, which was bringing together people who were using um, older people using social care so, so they had a bigger say over the services they were receiving uh, and we worked with Hillary adopted some of that and adapted it to Lambeth as well and you know there, there's an obvious synergy between what, what she was doing what she was saying we were trying to pilot exactly that and sort of we, we learned from each other you know to the extent that I even provided feedback on the drafts of her um, excellent book that she published on all of this not so long ago what, what you find is there's an awful lot of people all over the country that are doing things like this. You know, that I think communities are innately cooperative. Pe people want to be, we're, human beings are social creatures. We want to do things with each other. We see, we see value in that. But the state, as we've come to know it, has become quite top down, quite rigid, quite atomizing instead of collaborative. And, and what we find is when, when you go back to some of those principles that were there at the, the, you know, politically for me, the founding of the Labour Party, 
those traditions of cooperativism, mutualism, uh, the friendly societies. There's an awful lot in that that we can learn from and adapt today to remake the state. So the, the point about the state becomes not how big it is or how controlling it is, but how much you can put it um, at the service, at the command of the people who need to use uh, the support provided by the state. So you get a much more responsive system. And I think what you're pushing to in, an order, in all of this is really resetting the relationship between citizens and the state so that power is in the hands of citizens far more. And that, that's an approach. It's not a legal model. It plays out differently in different communities and in different services. But I believe it has the power to renew democracy um, for the coming decades, when right now it feels to me that democracy is under threat from all sorts of quarters. Thanks. Um, I think we'll jump to our second question. Mike, you can be happy to pick up on work, Hillary's work if you'd like to later on in your responses. Great. Okay. So, Question. so Sue Maddock had her hand up. Um, Sue, can you can you speak? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hear. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed that. Thanks, uh, Mike and um, Steve. Um, I wanted to make a pitch for small towns because, particularly at the moment, it's really interesting that. Uh, in, across the country over the last three months the level of organization has increased phenomenally and in particularly in South Devon towns where there already are independent councils a um, lot of progressive councillors and I'm we uh, have a pilot which you might be interested in um, Francis or an experiment in Buckfastley mm -hmm. where the a move um, by uh, well initially just by the um, independent progressive council but latterly we've set up a living uh, well-being centre to reconnect inequalities and with um, well-being and one of the one of the difficult I mean to Steve really one of the difficulties is a is incredibly difficult we have no data that actually you know gets down to the level that we're talking about the numbers involved in terms of inequalities are small compared to cities so what we're aiming to do is to work across a number of towns in South Devon so that we at least have a sort of um, it was something that could be taken notice of in terms of, of something that's gone a bit more to scale in terms of numbers because it's really difficult actually um, just identifying the way inequalities work but more positively over the last couple of months the the level of community organization has sort of demonstrated how fast um, with good uh, local leaders um, people are you know filling a huge gap so it isn't like there's a competition between different services you know approaching change and transformation in different ways but there's just a huge gap and there's nothing really there and um, the data uh, better data would work and it's also the case that it, it looks like that there are sort of examples in a sort of micro way in very small uh, these small towns like Ashburton, Buckfastley, where you know people are really working both on the sort of democratic deficit and also uh, wealth creation in terms of the local economy mm -hmm. and through social enterprise. And it, I think this is an example that's worth uh, you know just flagging up that it's not just cities, but also we really need some help. Thanks, Sue. That's a great question. Just a little shout Sorry, out. Sorry, it's not a question. Not <laughs> well, it's, it's a question for us to deal with. What about towns? And also another shout out with, that we do have Lisa Nandy, uh, Queen of Towns, on next week uh, on the podcast. So do tune in for that. But I'd like to put this over to Mike because you have actually been doing quite a bit of thinking about this in relation to scale and the relationship also between city and town and spaces like that. And you're not from London originally yourself. So I know you might have some reflections about this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, and I, um, you know, I think one of the legacies of of this crisis is, as well as the sort of move towards, um, okay, we can all work from home, and we've got this amazing ways now of sort of um, collaborating way beyond our immediate localities through things like Zoom, and you know, and people are beginning to learn actually what we can do digitally. I think the other sort of prong of that, the other, the flip side of that coin, 
is actually one of the things I think is going to be a clear legacy out of this crisis is going to be the return to more of the hyper local and and people having to have access to support and the goods that they need within their immediate locality within within um, areas that are walkable or areas that are cyclable you know areas where actually I don't need to roam too far in order to be able to receive and get access to the goods um, and support networks that I need so I, I think that's going to be a critical legacy of this crisis I think we've already seen actually where things like mutual aid are working they're often best at the hyper hyper local at the street level um, rather than even at the neighborhood level but I think you know Sue the the a real focus of our work here um, is on not on the city uh, in terms of not even on the borough it's actually about some of the neighborhoods and the the unit that we're often thinking about here and I think this this overlaps very clearly with some of the experiments you were talking about there in towns. I think it overlaps um, with some of the things that I say, as I'm saying, is going to come out of the legacy of this, is going to be a reimagining of actually what, what's that neighbourhood unit look like. So we're, we're focused on um, Woolworth, which is three wards within the local authority of Southwark. That's about 45,000 usual residents. Um, and I think that's about the right sort of scale. That's the neighbourhood through which our lives are uh, are sort of reflect, refracted. That's the way, that's the neighborhood that we walk through, that's the neighborhood that we shop in, that's the neighborhood where we use the pub, where we use the cinema. That's the type of neighborhood that I think is going to make more sense as we come out of this next phase of this crisis. Mm -hmm. I think there are real questions about what are the core ingredients, and I think it's going to be less about service design, and this is where, you know, to pick up on the comments about Hillary Cotton, I think this is in full accord with Hillary, it's going to be less around um, it's not about sort of pumping money back into our 1950s institutions and these 1950s public services. I think the legacy of this crisis, as well as a focus on the hyper-local, will also be, uh, or there's the potential for it to be, a focus not just on service delivery, but on the way and the context in which services and other support are provided. And I think a neighbourhood, thinking about a neighbourhood is very much a context in which life happens. And I think that accords really clearly also with some of the threads that, that Steve's been picking up from his experience at Lambeth, um, where it's actually about, you know, at the neighbourhood level or at the town level, that's at the level at which I can begin, you know, I can begin to learn to cooperate collaboratively with people whom, with whom I share my life, but maybe I don't know, um, and people who are different to me and have different opinions. That's where democracy is practised and socialised. Um, and, you know, for the settlement vision, you know, picking up on our history, again with Jane Adams. Jane Adams talks about this amazing phrase about actually we need to socialize democracy, we need to practice it in order locally in order to be able to practice it nationally. And I think so the, the return back to the town or the return back to the neighborhood and finding ways in which we can practice that democracy there is going to be one of the key elements actually of us thinking about what a better new normal looks like and thinking about how we can learn the lessons by doing practicing that democracy locally in order to be able to practice it nationally. Yeah, I know Steve will have a lot to say about this, but I am going to bring in uh, another question. And Steve, you're very welcome to, to link these ideas up as we go on, um, because I know you've been doing a lot of thinking about that, not least, least in relation to national democracy and the linkages between the two. But Grace, next question, please. All right, uh, Paul, Paul Cotterill, can you, can you hear us? And if so, do you want to ask your question? Hi Paul. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll put it in the chat, but I don't think Steve will be able to see the chat, so because he's on the phone, I'm thinking. So I'll kind of repeat it. Uh, it's kind of a question for Steve, but also building on what Mike was saying about moving on from what I might call the aid distribution stuff, but focusing really on small businesses and, as, and re referring also particularly to small towns, as Sue has mentioned. Um, it's not rocket science to think that. Um, in this, as uh, the sort of disease goes away, town centres are going to get really badly hit, and particularly the hospitality and retail sector, as furlough goes away, kind of stuff. So I was just thinking about uh, what Steve thought of these um, sort of emerging proposals around um, local authorities using reserves and, and other stuff they can generate. I'll come back I'll to come back to that briefly. Um, to do things about shared equity with small businesses that might otherwise go out of business. So sort of sticking cash into them for a share, maybe ideally I think with a sort of buyback thing for the businesses so they can go fully private again if they want to, but also with some conditionality about getting involved in green stuff in the town centre, maybe some stuff about local supply chain, what I've called, you know, sort of legacy civic value 
uh, picking up on what Mike was saying. So I was really just wondering, you know, what thoughts people had about that, maybe also building in the ideas of the community bond stuff um, that Warrington, for example, up my way have, have been picking up on, um, getting people to put sort of, um, um, to take small shares as little as a fiver and as much as, as you want to kind of stuff um, in ways which could support potentially blighted town centres, but also other places, you know, arts and, arts and cultural bits of your towns. Sorry, I'm rubbing it on a bit there. But no, talking. that's great. Thanks, Paul. Over to you, Steve. I know you'll definitely have a lot to say about this. But try and keep it brief if you can, so we can yeah. squeeze in one more question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll try. Uh, yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, I, I agree. I, I mean, I think the way that this, this works is when you've got um, councils that work more collaboratively with, with collaboratively with their communities, they should collectively set the objectives that they want to achieve for those communities. And in many cases, one of those will be um, local jobs, uh, keeping wealth in that community. If that is an outcome they collectively decide they want to achieve, then using the council's own purchasing power in the locality, uh, councils have a lot of, of potential purchasing power, um, gives them the ability to do that. So they should absolutely uh, be, be doing it. I, I, I think this links a bit to something Sue, that Sue, Sue made me, I, I started thinking about while I was listening to, to Sue as well, and it was a it was a project we, we looked at, but we never actually got going. Um, uh, but it built on the pr previous Labour government's um, uh, total, total place agenda. And we, we, we called it the Zero Rules Project. What if you took a neighbourhood, a community, particularly if it was um, a more deprived community, and you could aggregate together all of the spending that was going into that community to, to help those people? If you could add it all together from all of the different sources of the state primarily that it was coming from uh, and identify that figure and then engage the people who were receiving it in a process to decide how they really wanted it spent rather than it just coming at them from pre-existing silos, you'd probably end up with a model of spending that would be dramatically different to the one we have now. But because you are building it on the insight uh, and life experience of the people you're seeking to help, it would probably be used better to do the things they wanted to achieve. Now, if you're, if you're talking about a highly marginalized, um, deprived community, I would have thought that building community assets, community wealth and jobs and skills development would have been quite a high set apart part of their uh, priorities. And this, this, this model of doing it differently would allow you to, but you, you fundamentally have to break the top down system we currently have, where support is directed from above at people to an extent whether they want it done that way or not um, and invert that so that the people you're trying to support are put at the mm -hmm. center and they are supported and helped to articulate what it is that they actually want to achieve uh, in their lives or through interventions in their community uh, and then you work collaboratively with them to develop that and it, it, it creates a slightly a, 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 it's not slightly different a radically different model for what a council can be and, and i think it starts pushing more into the realm of platform cooperativism where where the council with all of the uh, back office resources that it has you know it systems finance systems legal and regulatory compliance safeguarding all of that becomes a platform that the whole community can access perhaps even small enterprises to help achieve the outcomes that that community defines for itself. That is a radically different model of local government to the one that we have now, but I think it would be dramatically more responsive and effective and empowering uh, the, the, than the way that we use our resources currently. I think that fits in with both of your uh, questions there. Yeah, that absolutely does. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we have time for one final question. I'm promising everyone we're going to have a hard stop in the language of Zoom at five past seven. But just I thought it's worth uh, getting in one more question because Steve was a little bit late joining the call as well. So Grace, next question, please. All right, last one. Um, Marjorie Drake, can you hear us? And if so, can you speak? Come on, Marjorie, you can do it. <laughs> Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Marjorie. Well, I've done it. Yes. I think. Yes, sorry, it's okay. Yeah, I was just wondering what the panelists thought about citizens' juries and whether um, Labour will be pushing to promote these uh, a lot more. They have worked very well in all over the world, um, and I would like to see more of this happening. 
bang on Marjorie and definitely because we at Compass are a massive fan of sits and juries I'm really glad you asked that um I also going to put this actually across the mic to start with and then I'm going to ask Steve because I think it's this question of practicing democracy and this work at a really hyper local level um and at the national level so some of you might know that Compass is a supportive of a constitutional convention I worked on a big project on that last year and has been pushing ideas of citizens assemblies at the local level so I'm really interested in how the two intersect Mike, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think they're, I think they're really exciting. Um, and I think I would echo back this, this notion of actually we need to practice and socialise democracy. I think there's a, the, one of the crucial elements of citizens as juries has been like the performative nature of it. It's actually getting people and the education involved in the actual performance itself. And I think that's one of the key things that I think we need to be investing in if we are going to, again, sort of learn how to engage in these collaborative projects, especially collaborative projects with people who don't necessarily agree with us. And if, if my thesis is right, that actually we need to learn that at the local level and then think about how these can translate at, at, at a wider national level. For me, it wouldn't be about these one-off citizens juries on some of these big national debates, but actually how do we begin to practice um, and embed some of this in, in the normal everyday hustle and bustle of, of local politics. So I, I would just say, I think, yeah, we would, we would support them and, and would be excited to see them. I don't think, I get worried when they're seen as a silver bullet. Um, and, that's, and I think that's one of the keys. I think we just need to see the context in which citizens' juries are appropriate and the, and the context in which um, they're not. But I think for me, in the performative nature and the socializing and the practice, they have a critical role to play. And I think just to pick up from that on, on Steve's comment previously, I think they could be an element of this model of um, beginning to sort of reduce this distinction between sort of state and citizen. And I think one of the key element insights of, of I think some of the, the conversation that we've had here and some of the drawing some of those strands together, there's an insight at the heart of this where we've come to this idea where the state is something sort of other and separate to and above and hovering above citizens. I think some of the most exciting things that we've seen come out of the crisis has been actually where we begin a different vision of a state, which is the state is, is actually the greatest achievement of community. You know, it's the greatest, it's the greatest sort of, um, our greatest effort, our collaborative effort together is what we make and how we look after each other collaboratively at the local level and at the national level. And I think um, that's got to be one of the things that we, we sort of push forward on. And again, as one of the legacies of the crisis. Steve. Yeah, I, I think they have a role to play. I, I, I don't think they're everything. Um, they, they have their place. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested very much in how we embed responsiveness in the system the whole time, not how you create a moment of responsiveness. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking particularly, what, what I'm most bothered about in this is not that part of our community which is able to participate in decision making, it tends to be more educated, um, more middle class, people who can assert voice in any case. But something like 80% of um, public spending is directed at the 20% who are the most socially marginalized, the least able to participate um, without additional support. And I think the role of the state can be to wrap capacity around those people to help them to participate in the decisions that directly affect their own lives. But it has to be um, an ongoing process and not, uh, not, not a one-off process. And where we do that, I think one of the reasons that, that, that the most socially marginalized are so marginalized is that they no longer feel they have a voice that will be heard if they try to assert it. So they give up after a lifetime of experiencing no one listens to me, or in some cases, generations of people feeling no one listens to me, they just give up. Um, but it's amazing how quickly you can rebuild that self-confidence uh, self and sense of self-reliance by starting to involve those people directly in the decisions that affect them day to day, even people with some of the most challenging circumstances um, you can imagine. I've seen it uh, make a difference that way. And if you rebuild people's capacity to participate and their own self-confidence in themselves, we can start to tackle um, some of the things that under, underlie uh, the reasons for people's social exclusion. And my, my view is we're talking here about an inequality of power that underpins the more visible inequalities of wealth, opportunity, health and education that we can see. But by addressing that inequality of power, we give people 
access to the resources they need to effect change across all of those other areas. And in that lies the more that lies for my money, in that lies the, the progressive politics of the future. Completely agree. And I'd just like to reiterate that um, I think having been a facilitator and a designer at Citizen Assemblies, that one of the most powerful ways you can sell the idea to people, including politicians, is the experience of it. Um, seeing participants, uh, randomly selected citizens, strangers sitting around a table trying to make a decision is often very moving. It can be also extremely boring, but that's really important as well because politics is not always exciting. But also those connections and the possibility for that kind of educative function for these assemblies, as Mike said, I think is incredibly powerful and making those relationships with people often at a local level, people they would other, otherwise not come across and at a national level, I think can be super powerful. So as some of you members will know, Compass is um, very much a proponent of citizen assemblies and interested in all deliberative practice. So do check out some of our publications which cover some of those themes as well. Um, it's time for me to wrap up and I will wrap up by saying a couple of different things. So one is obviously a huge thank you to Mike and Steve for your time. Both of you are manically busy at the moment operating on lots of different levels and so it was great that you were able to join us this evening and um, share some insights and thoughts from the past few weeks and from your experiences so far. Um, I really like to invite you to support the work that Mike and all of the team here do at Pembroke House um, if you can. Um, really in these in current moment because we're continuing to support people who are quite food insecure and also we're, we're trying to run a lot of projects online as well. So if you'd like to donate, um, even a tiny bit would help. Um, please do go to the website, which I think Grace might be able to put in the chat box. Um, it's also on Twitter, but it's www.pembrokehouse.org.uk and you can donate to help food cubs continue to work and hear more about PH's work and sign up as a volunteer. Next week, we'll be joined by Labour MP for Wigan and as previously promised, Shadow Foreign Secretary uh, Lisa Mandy. She'll be discussing her new post, what she learned running for Labour leader and what this crisis means for international cooperation. So until then, thanks very much for sticking with us, guys. Uh, thanks hugely again to Mike and Steve. Uh, please remember that it's bloody complicated and please do also keep safe and well uh, and continue to connect with Compass and our work. Massive thanks to Grace and Jack for helping me through this as well. You've been amazing, Grace. Hey. Uh, and uh, huge thanks to the rest of you for joining us. Please do go away and enjoy your Tuesday evenings. Thanks and good night. So. If you like what you've heard today and want to be part of a much more equal, democratic and sustainable future, a good society, then visit us at compassonline.org.uk forward slash podcast and you'll be able to join us live on future calls just like this one. You can tweet me at neal, N-E-A-L underscore compass or compass at compass office. And if you've enjoyed this week's episode, please give us a rating will help us reach more listeners in the future and it's only fair that they know it's bloody complicated too.